Well, let me go ahead and welcome you to North Star. We're so excited that you're here today. I'm going to get the technical guys uh, to run up here and turn on the TV for me. I don't know what happened, but it's unplugged, guys. And so um, if somebody can take care of that, that would be awesome. Uh, Y'all see them running around the background. Don't worry, nothing bad's going on. They're just going to fix the TV so when I teach, uh, we can have that. If not, I'm going to teach a little bit different today. So anyways, we are so glad that you're here today at North Star. We are going to be kicking off a brand new series today that I've entitled, uh, that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks together, entitled um, How to Bible. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, how to Bible, why would you uh, kind of talk about the Bible? Well, there's a very good reason we're going to talk about the Bible over the next few weeks, because the Bible is a vital part of everything that we believe as a church, and not only as a church, but everything that we believe as followers of Jesus. And probably there are some of you that are here that, that maybe you're kicking the tires of the Christian faith. Uh, you call yourself a seeker or maybe an explorer, and you might not even believe the Bible. You may think to yourself, hey, I don't even know that I really believe the Bible, that I understand the Bible, um, and I, I completely get that. And that's okay because what I'm going to do is I'm going to help lay a foundation for you over the next few weeks that will help you to understand why we believe the Bible is the Word of God, the significance and the importance of it to each and every one of our lives, and maybe even answer some of the questions that you've had throughout the years uh, in your own life personally about the Bible. So let me just kind of illustrate that for you just for a moment. So over the next few weeks, over the next five weeks together, we're going to talk about how to read the Bible, understand the Bible, interpret it, and even apply it to our lives. And for many of you, maybe you've struggled through that in your life to try to understand how to do that. We're going to dig into this last one, the one on how to apply it, and we're going to look at it for over two weeks, and we're going to explore how important that is to our lives and how each and every one of us uh, really need to understand how to apply the Bible to our lives. And then we're going to dig into this. We're going to explore whether or not we really the Bible that we have is the original Word of God. Uh, we're going to look at what it means textually to each and every one of us and the significance of that. And then we're going to talk about the archaeological records of the Bible and the importance of that. And what about the track record of the prophecies? How, how does that, some of you may not even know what that is. And we're going to talk about that. And like when the Bible gave a prophecy, can we believe that that is really true? And how does it apply to each and every one of us today? And then we're going to look at questions that people have about the Bible, such as whether or not there are lost books of the Bible out there. Because some of you in college... You may have been taught that, and I'm going to directly uh, address that question. What about all the different translations? What about Bible and science? How do the two work together? And then we're going to look at and talk about what about all the supposed contradictions in the Bible. And so, as you can tell, it's going to be quite a ride over these next five weeks together. But I think that each week you're going to leave not only challenged uh, in your own thought process, but you're probably going to be challenged in your life personally to, to really begin to understand the Bible and the significance that it has to each and to every one of our lives. And so today, what I'm going to do is take a few moments to sort of lay a foundation for where we're going to go over the next few weeks together. Now, I'm going to take a shot at this and see if this is going to work for me. Um, and so let me kind of show you. I'm going to jump down just for a moment. Uh, I had some questions I was going to ask but I'm going to pass by that. And I want to jump down to this very first point. And I want to begin by just having you write this down because I think this is important. When you look at the Bible, the Bible is a library. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something across all of our campuses just for a moment. If you'll notice in front of you or under your seat, there is a Bible. I want you to pick it up and take it out and hold on to it just for a moment, okay? Now, I know maybe you've never touched a Bible before. Hey, let me just tell you this. It's not going to bite you, I promise you, okay? The person next to you has a better chance of biting you than the Bible does, all right? So just hold on to it for a second. And I want to encourage you to do something here. I want you to turn to the first two pages in the Bible, uh, I'm going to hold this up so you can see it, especially the one that we've given you, there's something called contents, the content page. And it has all the, it has all the, all the listings of all of the different books of the Bible. And I want you just to hold that in front of you just for a second. And here's why, because I'm sort of going to walk you through this, because I, I want you to understand this a little bit better. When you look at this, you probably look at it and you say, okay, the Bible is a book. But here's what I want you to think of. The Bible is actually a library. It's a library. It is a bunch of books that are compiled together, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Now, here's something that you can write down. 
There are 66, to be exact, books in the Bible written by over 40 authors covering a period of around 1,500 years, all right? So that just means that there are over 40 authors that, that have written in the Bible. There are 66 books to be exact and around 1,500 years that it covers, okay? Now this is important for you to understand because when you think about the Bible, don't think of it as just a book. Think of it as what? Think of it as a library. Now, let me explain that for a moment because this is important. So when you look right here in the Bible at the very, uh, I guess you could say, as you look at the contents, you see that it's divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to talk about that in a second. But as you look at the books, let me just help you to understand. It's a lot like walking into a library, okay? There are books that are historical inside of the Bible, there are books that are written by authors who bear the name of the author. There are books that were written to specific groups of people, and the book bears the name of the people that it was written to. There are books that are about prophecy. There are books that are poetic. There are books that are about philosophy. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us a lot about life and how to live life. Proverbs is a book that gives us a lot of wisdom. So there are wisdom books in the Bible. And so it's like a library. There's like all kinds of stuff that is there for us to help us to be able to understand. So the book of Isaiah bears the name of the writer, a guy by the name of Isaiah. The book of Daniel bears the name of the writer of the book, a guy by the name of Daniel. And then when you get into the book of, of Genesis, Genesis gives us a history, okay? Uh, Exodus gives us history, right? Genesis, the word Genesis just simply means this. It means the creation or the beginning of the world. And so when you read the book of Genesis, it's like a history book. It tells us what happened in the beginning. Exodus is a history of the people of Israel being exited out of what? Out, out of captivity by Moses. So it's just a history book. It gives us the history of what happened. Then when you get into the New Testament, you have individuals that wrote letters, and the letters bear the name of the people that they were written to. So in the New Testament, you had the book of Philippians that was written to a group of people in a city called Philippi. You have a group of people that a book was written to called 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and they were the Corinthians who lived in Corinth. And so the book bears the name of the people that the book was written to. So the first thing we learn is this. The Bible is a library. It's important for us to understand that. The second thing I want you to write down is this. Not only is the Bible a library, but the Bible is two testaments. It's divided into two halves, all right? Two different testaments. Now, when we think about testaments... Here's the thing that I want you to think about. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look right there at your contents and you'll see it. Up at the top it says Old Testament. Down below it says New Testament. Why is this important, right? Let me just show you because you can write this down in your notes. There's a place for you to do this. The Old Testament is made up of 39 of the 66 books. It's the largest portion of the Bible, okay? The New Testament is made up of 27 of the 66 books. All right, so you can see how it's divided. There are 39 in the Old Testament. There are 27 in the New Testament. Now, this is important. You see, the word testament simply means this. It's the idea of agreement or covenant. I put it in your notes for you. The word testament simply means agreement or covenant. The Old Testament deals with God's covenant with mankind before the coming of Christ. The New Testament deals with God's covenant with mankind after the coming of Christ. So just like history, Jesus splits the Bible in half. We have the Old Testament that is before Jesus. We have the New Testament that is after Jesus. And what the New Testament and the Old Testament give us is they give us the covenant or the promises that God specifically had with his people. So when you think about promises, maybe you're here today and you don't know a whole lot about the Bible. Maybe you've never read the Bible. Maybe you've never believed the Bible. But in the Bible, God gives specific promises to those who choose to be followers of Jesus. He gives specific promises to those of us who are followers of Christ. And the reason that the Bible is so important to us 
is that the Bible becomes, I guess you could say, our playbook for life. It tells us not only how to live life, but it tells us how we can have the best life that God wants for each and every one of us and how we are able to experience the life that he designed for each and every one of us to live. Now, here's an interesting question. I just want to ask this. You may not even know this, but I want to just kind of help you to understand. How did the Bible become the Bible? Now, what I mean by that is, is how did it get its name, the Bible? All right? This is important. I didn't even know this. I went to seminary, and they didn't even teach us this in seminary. But as I was studying, I discovered something that I'd never seen before. The Bible derived its name because it was written by something called Biblos, or the Biblos Read. So they would write, and then they would wrap or tie it in what was called the Biblos Read, and it was used for making scrolls or books. So every book before the Bible was called a Biblios or a Bible, okay? Now think about this just for a second. I'd never seen this before. The original name for the Bible came because it was considered the book of all books. It was the Bible. And so the word came from the original word, biblios, read, that was used for making scrolls and books. And because of that, eventually they gave it the name, the Bible, meaning that it was the book of all the books that had been written. So it's a library. The second thing we learn is that it's divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then thirdly, notice this, the Bible is sacred. The Bible is sacred. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here, especially for those of you maybe that you wonder why, as followers of Jesus, we believe this book is sacred. And I want to talk about that, and hopefully what I'm going to do is to help some of you understand, because maybe in your mind you thought, hey, you know what? I, it's just hard for me to believe that this book is sacred. It's hard for me to understand the holiness of what God did with this book, and we're going to deal with that for these next few moments. So what I want you to consider for the next few moments is the sacredness of the Bible. Why are these considered the Word of God? Why, when we look at the Old Testament, do we say that it's God's Word? And why, when we look at the New Testament, do we say that it's the Word of God? You see, we take the writings of the Bible as the Word of God for our lives for one reason. And it's important to understand this reason, and it's just simply this. It's Jesus. And you can put that in your notes. I wrote it there for you because some of you probably have never realized this. We believe it's the Word of God, not because a group of scholars sat in a room somewhere and put the Bible together, not because there were individuals that said, this is the Word of God, but because of what Jesus said. Jesus believed that the Old Testament was God-breathed. He believed that it was the Word of God. And if Jesus believed it, then as followers of Jesus, it would only make sense that we embrace what Jesus said. That Jesus, if he was who he said he was, if he was the Son of God, if Jesus was, was uh, God himself in human flesh, if he really was the Messiah of the world, if he was the one who was crucified on a cross and buried and then resurrected and said that he believed that the Old Testament was God-breathed and that it was scriptures, would it not make sense for us also to embrace it as scripture and as God-breathed? as God -breathed? You see, the Old Testament was seen as sacred before Jesus. They recorded God's dealings and God's prophets. The people and they had, uh, had seen and heard uh, what they had seen and heard. And at the same time with the New Testament, we're going to discover that Jesus set into action everything that was going to be written, and he was the, the one behind the idea of the New Testament. You see, if you believe that Jesus was who he said he was, then you have to believe what Jesus says about Scripture. In fact, it's important to understand that it is sacred and that it is inspired. You see, it's not about what book you and I think should be included in the Bible. And it's not about what you and I think about the Bible. It's about what Jesus said about the Bible. And Jesus accepted it as scripture because he believed that it was God-breathed. In fact, I'm going to share with you a couple of verses. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18, I want you to listen to what Jesus said. 
He said, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law of Moses until everything is accomplished. So what he was saying was, he said, every single bit of this was accomplished by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, and it was written down for our benefit, for us to be able to understand who God is and, and the purpose and the plan and the promises that God has for each and every one of us in our lives. And then Jesus later goes on in John 10 and verse 35. He says, the scriptures cannot be broken. He was basically saying this. He said, the scriptures are God-breathed. They were given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 12, verse 36, it says this. Jesus said, David himself speaking by, and let's say that word out loud together, speaking by what? What's the word there? Holy Spirit. He said, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared. And then he goes on and Jesus quotes what David said. What was he saying? He was saying David wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So David gave to us, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Jesus said to us, David was inspired by the Holy Spirit, therefore what he wrote down was inspired by God. So clearly, to Jesus, the Old Testament was no ordinary collections of writings. He referred to the writers of the Old Testament as being inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was the very Word of God. Now, here's what's important. When you come to the New Testament, all right, you begin to ask the question, how did Jesus establish the New Testament? Because again, the foundation of what we believe is because of what Jesus said. And so when we come to the New Testament, and I'm going to read this because I said it wrong in the first service, and I want to make sure I say it right, I want you to listen to what I've put here. All right? So when it comes to the New Testament, first, because a lot of it records just what he said, talking about Jesus and what he taught. And if he was God in human form and said something, I would call that scripture. That is, Jesus, the words that he spoke were the word of God, and because they were, they were scripture. I think it soundly falls under that category. Now stay, stay with me just for a second. Pay attention. Some of you are like, hey, this is a lot that I'm drinking from a fire hose, but if you'll stay with me, I'm fixing to apply it, all right? Just listen for a second. But he also laid the foundations for the writing of the rest of the New Testament to be accepted as Scripture through the apostles. All right, now watch this. You see, this is really important, and it's probably something that a lot of you have never heard before. Jesus established the apostles. He chose the word apostle for the 12 of his disciples in order to indicate their role, what they specifically were going to do. The word apostle means those who have been sent... And the mission that Jesus sent them on was that of preaching and teaching the Word of God. So when you think about the 12 disciples, it was the 12 apostles, the specific assignment that they were giving is that they would go forth and they would teach the Word of God. That the Holy Spirit of God, we'll get to this in a minute, was going to help them recall the things that Jesus had been teaching them and specifically talking to them about that they were going to go and teach those exact same things. So they were given authority by Jesus to speak the words that Jesus had, ta had taught them. You see, the word is used 12 times originally, uh, chosen by Jesus, and a handful of select others, most notably the Apostle Paul. The apostles have received a unique commission from Jesus himself, never to be repeated, to assume the prophetic role of speaking God's word to the people that they would encounter and who they would preach to. There were the men who would speak in the name of Jesus and they would carry his word to the rest of the world. You see, Jesus even said these words to them as recorded in the New Testament book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, listen to what it says. He who receives you receives me, is what Jesus said. He said, so when you go to teach, you're teaching by my authority and on my behalf. So each apostle was given a personal commission by Jesus himself. They were never self-appointed. You see, as the literal Greek says, the apostle Paul, basically in, in Acts chapter 26, said that there was this interaction between him and Jesus. And, and Paul talks about how Jesus 
appointed him specifically to be an apostle in order to represent the word of God. They were with Jesus. The apostles spent time with Jesus. They were mentored by Jesus. And therefore, they knew all the things that had happened in the life of Jesus. Many of them were eyewitnesses to the resurrection account of the life of Jesus. This is why when they decided to replace Judas, if you remember, who betrayed Jesus, that they got alone and they began to pray, and they gave us specific qualifications for what that person had to be like. In John chapter 16, verses 12 and 14, I want you to listen to what the Bible says, thinking about this, this idea. It says, The Spirit shows what is true and will come and guide you into the full truth by taking my message and telling it to you. Here's what he was saying to the apostles. At the right time, the Spirit of God is going to speak to you. He's going to inspire you, and he's going to tell you exactly what to say. So when you look at the New Testament, the conclusion is this. It was through the apostles that Jesus established the writing of the New Testament. And it doesn't mean that all the apostles wrote the New Testament. Many of them wrote the New Testament are people who had been influenced by them uh, under their guidance and leadership were a part of writing what we have today as the New Testament. Now this is important because what the apostles did is they helped us to understand the significance and the importance of the New Testament. The, the eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus in fact, if you don't know this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what we call the synoptic gospels. And what those gospels do for us is they give us the life story of Jesus. These were men who were with Jesus. These were individuals that had seen Jesus not only with their eyes, but they had an eyewitness account. Luke, who was a physician, if you remember, we talked about this a couple of Easter's ago. He was a physician. He went around and, and, and found out about all of the details of the life of Jesus, and he wrote those down in order that we could have the account of Jesus' life. And so when we get to the New Testament, what do we do? We believe it because why? Because Jesus believed it. Now, one more fact, and we're going to move on. You see, what happened was, is that there was this ancient church meeting, this official meeting that took place. It was called the Council of, of Gem I'm sorry, Geminiah in AD 90, and there is where they approved the Old Testament that we have today. Then, in 397, the New Testament through the Council of Carthage was approved as the New Testament. Now, how did they decide what was going to go into the New Testament? It was important to understand that the selection process was very simple. It had to be God-breathed. It had to be that it was something that Jesus said, words that he had spoken, that one of the apostles or someone that was related to one of the apostles had written down. And if it was outside the context of that, it did not get put into the New Testament. So let me just answer this question. There are people that say, hey, there are lost books of the Bible out there. That is not true. Now, there are people that try to say that that's true, but those were books that were written. And because they don't fall up under the category that we've talked about, they were not included into the New Testament. In fact, I have read some of those books, and if you read them, it is very easy to see why they were not included. In fact, some of them have heresy that's written inside of them. Ladies, I would just tell you this. One, one of the ones that I read said this. It said, in order for women to be able to get into heaven, they had to, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something, they had to do something uh, that, that made them uh, look like a lion. And when you read that, you would just go, that seems absolutely crazy. Like, why would it say something like that? And so the council took those books and they said, these are not a part of the New Testament. So we believe as followers of Jesus, for those of you that are here today and you're not a follower of Christ, when you say, why do y'all believe the Bible to be the word of God? The answer is very simple, because Jesus believed the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures, to be the word of God, and Jesus established the foundation from which the New Testament would be written. Much of it being his own words, much of the, uh, the, the other part of the New Testament being what? Being people who were eyewitnesses to the, lives, to the life of Jesus, writing out of the personal inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, the last one I want to write down is this. Uh, number four, the Bible is inspired. The Bible is inspired. What does that mean? 
just very quickly, and we're going to apply all of this. This isn't a normal book. Like, guys, when we approach this, this, this is not just a book. Like, some, some of you, you think, you know what, it's just a book. I mean, right? I mean, it's got some good stuff in it. I mean, it's got a little bit of history. It's got some good things about life and some other things that, that you can read about. But it's just a book. No, it's more than a book. It's sacred. It's sacred. It's important for us to understand this. This book is not a normal book. It is inspired by God. And what we have to do is to be careful not to water it down. Not to dilute the context of what it says and what it means for each and every one of our lives. You see, sometimes we use the word inspired to mean something like this. We'll say, that was wonderful inspiration. And maybe it's in reference to a painting by Rembrandt or music by Bach or maybe even a play by Shakespeare. But that waters down the word inspiration. In fact, it's important for you to understand that we use that word to refer to something that we feel. How we find beauty in a sunset or, or power in a speech that is inspiring to us. When the Apostle Paul used the word, he used it in a very different context. Let me show you. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, listen to how Paul speaks of this idea of inspiration. But you must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know they are true, talking about Scripture and the writings that were being written during that day. For you know that you can trust those who taught you. He says, you have been taught by the Holy Scriptures. Notice, he refers to it as Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is, and what's the word there? Say it out loud together. Inspired. Inspired by who? Inspired by God. And is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. So here's what he's saying. This is the manual for life. If you want to know what's true, if you want to know how to live your life, if you want to know right from wrong and you want to be able to do, uh, make good decisions... He's saying, this is what this was given to, for, to you for. It's a manual for our lives. It's the manual that guides us and leads us as we live our life out each and every day. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people, those of us that are followers of Jesus, to do every good work. So what Paul was saying was, he said, the Bible is inspired by God. Now, here's what's important. What does the word inspired mean? Very simply, as we get ready to make some application, it means God breathed. That's what Paul was saying. He said the Bible is God breathed. It's the idea of the inspiration behind scriptures. God breathed it out. The men wrote it. We have it today. It was exhaled by God. It was produced by God. It's not a human book. It was written by authors who were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God so that we would have the truth of God's Word to be able to guide us each and every day in our lives. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Marty, that's a lot. I mean, good grief. Well, but here's what I want to do. I wanted to lay a foundation today. And the foundation is for us. Let me go just a little bit further. I want to show you some more scripture real quick. In Jeremiah 1 verse 9, it says, I, God, have put my words in your mouth. Notice, he's speaking of the Old Testament scriptures. God says, I put the word into the prophet's mouth. The prophet spoke them and they wrote them down. Then if you go to 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture, talking about the writing of scripture, no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. That is, they didn't just write what they wanted to write. They didn't just use their own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. They spoke from God. Now, let me just stop right here just for a moment. I'm going to sit down and I want to just talk to you from my heart as your pastor, okay? Now, some of you, you may be sitting here today going, all right, I get what you're trying to say. I understand where you're going, but why is this so important? Let me tell you why it's important. <clears throat> because if you want your life to have significance and meaning and purpose, the only way you're ever going to find that is when you believe what the Bible says. Men, let me just ask you this. 
Most of us as men have manuals at home. Now, let's just be honest for a second, all right? Wives, don't poke us, all right? Just let us do this for a second. We usually don't use those manuals. And therein lies the problem, right? Like, like we'll, we'll buy something. Oh, I got this. I got it figured out. Don't worry about it. You put it together. It doesn't run right. There's a problem. The reason is you didn't follow the manual, right? The manual tells you specifically what it is designed to do. The manual answers the questions to when something goes wrong, how you're to correct it or fix it or to make it right. You see, God in his infinite wisdom gave to us a manual for our lives. If you're here today and you're a student, students, let me just address you for a second. If you want to know what the purpose of life is, if you want to know what the meaning of life is, if you want direction for your life in the future, the Word of God has everything that you need for your life. You see, the Bible tells us how to have a great marriage. The Bible speaks to us about purpose in life. The Bible tells us how to make good decisions. The book of Proverbs is called the book of wisdom. It talks a lot about making decisions and the importance of how to make those good decisions. The Bible in the book of James talks about anger and how you deal with anger and difficult situations that you face in your life. The Bible tells you specifically about how to have great relationships and to navigate those relationships as you, as you go through life. The Bible tells us about finances and how to make good decisions and handle our finances in a way that not only honor God, but they help us to be financially sound and stable in the way that we live our lives. You see, God gave us the manual. The problem is we don't believe that it's the manual for life. We think it's just a book. It's more than a book. It's God-breathed. And because it was God-breathed, it becomes the very foundation for everything that we do living on this earth. You see, in our culture today, guys, listen to me. We don't need a psychologist to help us be able to figure things out. We don't need a sociologist to tell us how to change culture or society. We don't, we, don't even need, we, we, we don't even need a doctor in, in many ways. What we need is somebody to prophesy over our culture and to say that we are dead. We're dead because we're not staying with a book. It's life. God breathed it to us. It gives us life and tells us how to live. If we'll open it and we'll use it, it will direct us. It will help us. It will make our lives better. And I so believe it that over the next four weeks, I'm going to help you to understand it more than you have ever understood it in your life so that you can not only dig into it, but allow it to give you purpose and direction and significance. Because you know what? I really believe this. Some of you are sitting here today and you're wondering why your life is falling apart. I promise you. It's because you aren't using the manual. When you use the manual, our life becomes everything that God uniquely designed it to be. And it's better because here's what we believe at North Star. When Jesus Christ is at the center of your life, your life is just simply better. It's better. And as your pastor, I want that desperately for you in these next five weeks. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that God, your word is truth and that it is God-breathed. And we thank you that, Lord, you gave it to us as a manual for our lives. And God, for many of us today, if we were just honest, the reality of our life is this. We choose almost every day to live our life apart from the manual. Rather than going to the manual and trying to figure out what the problem is, God, we diagnose it ourselves or we allow others to diagnose it for us. And God, we never look into the manual of life that you've given us to find purpose and direction and significance and meaning, to get the hope that we need to be able to live life the way that you the creator of this universe uniquely designed for each and every one of us to be able to live. 
And God, I really believe that some of us today, the problem that we're having in life is that we've tried to live it apart from you. That we've said, no, I'm not going to believe the Bible, and no, I don't believe in Jesus. And God, because of that, we're sitting here today at one of our campuses or even online, and we're thinking to ourselves, my life is falling apart. And God, the answer is very simple. The answer is that we would just believe. And so with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and no one looking around, I want to just ask this question. I wonder how many of you today would say, you know, man, my life, my life is just not what it should be. And I want you to know today that what what the Bible says, God breathe, is that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the day that all can change, you will be saved. Apart from God, you will never be able to live the kind of life that he has uniquely designed you to live and that all begins with Jesus. And so right now, if you're willing to open your heart and to believe, that can all change for you. You say, Pastor Marty, what do I have to do? It's very simple. Pray a prayer, something like this in your heart. Just mean it to God. Say to him, dear God, I confess to you that I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I've been trying to live my life apart from you and from your word. And God, that's not working for me. And I know that the only way for me to live my life in the right way is to surrender my heart and my life to you. And so I do that in this moment. Jesus, please come into my heart and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Help me to live the Christian life now in the best way that I can. With our heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, if you just prayed that prayer, that is the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. And I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you to do something very brave. Nobody looking around at all of our campuses. But if you just prayed that prayer, I want to close today's service by praying for you. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to be brave. Would you just raise your hand and let me pray for you right now? There you go. Just hold it up there. God bless you. 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 Thank you so much. God bless you. You can put your hands down. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For those that are online right below me, you can click there. And for those of you at our other campuses, we see your hands. You can put them down. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, we rejoice in the name of Jesus for each and every person today who's stepping across the line of faith. God, we thank you for the newfound life and relationship that they have in you. God, help us over these next few weeks together to embrace your word. Help us to learn how to read it. Help us to learn how to apply it to our lives in such a way that, God, we will live differently because of what you have given us. For, Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people together said, amen, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here today. As our campus pastors make their way to the stage, I want us to do what we do every week here at North Star. Let's put our hands together and celebrate all those who committed their life to Christ.